Greetings. I am honored to join you as we celebrate the diversity of our faculty, staff, and student body. We recognize you and those who champion initiatives and programs to ensure inclusiveness and resilience at NAU. I am proud to see that as NAU has grown over the years, so has our diversity. The diversity of our student body is currently 39% or 11,535 students, a climb of nearly seven percentage points over the last five years. In addition, the diversity of our faculty and staff has grown to 22.1%. One initiative we recently launched in support of our efforts is the NAU Diversity Fellows Program. This program will assemble faculty and staff who are committed to diversity and inclusion to advise, serve, and assist NAU in implementing our diversity strategic plan. NAU's leadership team is fortunate to have the guidance and counsel of many caring students, faculty, and staff. Among those is diversity fellow and NAU professor, Dr. Gabe Montano. Gabe advises NAU on diversity initiatives, recruitment, and retention strategies. He also works with campus leaders on projects, awards, and recognitions, as well as guiding NAU on becoming an Hispanic-serving institution. The Office of Inclusion, IMQ, also works closely with student and faculty leaders in organizing and celebrating ethnic diversity throughout the year. IMQ supports programs and events that help us celebrate, honor, and learn from the voices of our entire community. Over the past decade, NAU student body has diversified to reflect the state population, ensuring NAU meets the state's goal of increasing the number of Arizonans pursuing a college degree. This includes an increase of first-generation college students, which make up 40% of our freshman class and 47% of all NAU students. There are many people and organizations to thank today. I would be remiss to not give my sincere gratitude to our LGBTQIA, Native American, Disability Access and Design, Status of Women, and Ethnic Diversity Commission. Your work is invaluable to creating a community that is fair and inclusive. To everyone taking part today, thank you for all you do for NAU and for ensuring we do our best to be inclusive and support our commitment to diversity. Thank you, President Chang. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 2020 Northern Arizona University Diversity and Equity Award celebration. Before we begin, I wanna make a statement as to the authenticity of the program and video participants. All videos are authentic and are direct contributions to the award celebration. We're pre-recorded in order to maintain health and safety of all participants and audience members. My name is Gabe Montano and my pronouns are he, him, his. I'm the chair of Applied Physics and Material Science, the chief scientist of MEDA, the Center for Materials Interfaces and Research and Applications, and the chief diversity fellow at NAU. I would like to first thank President Chang and her office for supporting our award celebration, and most importantly, for supporting the important work that NAU does in the name of diversity and inclusion. I want to recognize the tremendous struggles of our communities from the upper reaches of the Navajo Reservation to the borders of Nogales, and the disproportionate suffering that has occurred in underserved and minoritized communities. Our hearts and our tears are with all of you, and we will continue to strive for a better day a time when inequality ends and justice truly prevails. We can be proud as a community at NAU for the tremendous work and advances made in diversity and inclusion. This year, diversity and inclusion committee chairs and co-chairs came together to create a new entity of strength and leadership, the Commission on Commissions or COCOM. I want to recognize the amazing efforts of all the commission leaders. They continue to lead the charge toward achieving our vision of a true diversity university. I want to further recognize all of the commission members who have given tirelessly to lead the missions of diversity and inclusion. Last year also marked the introduction of a new presidential initiative, the launch of the Diversity Fellows Program. I am proud to announce that we are currently accepting applications for the Fellows Program with the planned announcement of NAU Diversity Fellows in January 2021. The NAU Diversity Fellows will serve along with COCOM and the commissions as campus leaders diversity and inclusion. 
and serve to help all institutional departments, units, and groups in operationalizing the diversity strategic plan. This year also saw the launch of NAU's first ever diversity strategic plan with a vision of creating the true diversity university. The DSP enables us to make directional progress toward change, align campus activities to maximize the impact of our efforts. It's not a finish line, it's a starting line, but that's what it takes to begin making the necessary progress. The DSP is a culmination of years of efforts by individuals and groups dedicated to diversity and inclusion. And I want to take a minute to recognize the remarkable contribu contributions and vision. We are at a precious time in history. The world has not seen a confluence of tragedy and social justice like this in generations. It creates a world of uncertainty that it, we are all trying to navigate together. But there is also hope and opportunity. Now more than ever, the need and importance of diversity and inclusion are self-evident. We observe on a daily basis how inequality manifests into disproportional tragedy, how we are all still so far from delivering the equal opportunity our nation's principles promote, and from the recognition that Black Lives Matter. We have a long way to go, but I truly am hopeful. I'm hopeful that we will get there together. And I believe that while we are facing tragedy not observed for generations, with that come opportunities that haven't existed for generations. Thank you for being my siblings in our continued struggle and fight. Together, we will see that promise of equality realized. Now it's my humbling and extraordinary pleasure to introduce Dr. Lydia Villacomaroff. Dr. Villacomaroff is a scientist, a businesswoman, diversity advocate, and a living legend. Now, were we in person, she would likely pinch my arm for saying that. But since we are recorded, I'm going to say it because it's true. Dr. Via Komarov was the third Mexican American woman in the United States to receive a doctorate in the sciences in 1975. And as a graduate student, was one of the youngest founding members of the Society for the Advancement of Chicanos, Hispanics, and Native Americans in Science, or SACNAS. This pioneering group of 40 or so individuals pioneered a movement, one that continues stronger than ever and now consists of over 25,000 strong and is the largest underrepresented minority STEM society in the country. It started with a handful of visionaries daring to create a world in which they weren't always the only ones. Lydia grew up in Santa Fe, New Mexico, influenced by her uncle, who's a chemist, and her mother and grandmother in the arts and nature. She attended the University of Washington as a chemistry major, but quickly changed her major to biology when she was told girls don't belong in chemistry. She moved to Baltimore and attended Goucher College, as John Hopkins did not accept women at the time. She attended MIT for graduate school, where she completed her PhD in molecular biology. Her scientific career itself is one of legend, working at MIT, Harvard, and Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, culminating in the first report showing that bacteria could be used to make pro-insulin. Dr. Via Komarov then began a career in education with the University of Massachusetts Medical School, Harvard, and Northwestern as a vice president for research and professor of neurology. Her storied career trans transcended science and education to business and continued advocacy. She's a former COO, CEO, CSO of multiple tech companies, and her pioneering accomplishments have been recognized as a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the Association for Women in Science. She was elected to the Hispanic Engineer National Achievement Hall of Fame, was awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award by Hispanic Business Magazine, was named 2008 Hispanic Scientist of the Year and the 2013 Woman of Distinction by the American Association of the University Women. I'm guessing if Johns Hopkins had it to do over again, maybe they would have reconsidered their archaic views. In the end, her professor who told her women aren't chemists was right. They're a hell of a lot more than just that. On a personal note, it has been my honor and my privilege to call Lydia my friend, my colleague, and most importantly, my mentor. It's because of her and all of those brave Sakinista founders that I ever made it through my career. And at every turn, she has never failed to be there with a word of encouragement and a call to action. When I asked Lydia if she would consider giving our keynote address this year, in typical fashion, her response was, let's meet this week to plan. Thus is my great and humbling opportunity to introduce my hero, Dr. Lydia Villacomarov. Hello from snowy Boston. 
It's a great pleasure to be here with you today. I only wish I could be there in person to meet with you and discuss the things that you are doing individually and collectively to integrate diversity, inclusion, and equity into the fabric of Northern Arizona University. Although I have received some acclaim as the fourth Mexican-American woman in the United States to receive a PhD in the natural sciences, I began from a position of privilege. My parents were college graduates. They were each the first in their family to go to college. I was born while they were in college, and so one would take classes in the morning and the other in the afternoon so that one of them could be home with me. My paternal grandparents immigrated from Mexico during the Mexican Revolution. My grandfather had no European blood. He was puro indio. My mother's forebears on both sides of the family came to the New World from the Basque region of Spain with the conquistadores. My maternal great-grandfather's sons joined him on the ranch in Arizona soon after they had mastered basic arithmetic and spelling, but he sent his daughters to normal school for teacher training after high school because he didn't want them to marry cowboys. My grandmother was a single mom. She married another descendant of the Spanish conquistadores, but divorced him when he became an alcoholic. Like my mother, my grandmother worked most of her life. She moved in with us when I was in grade school and was an important part of our lives. Growing up, Tio Jose, dad's younger brother, was a community organizer, and Uncle Ishmael had a master's degree in chemistry. My parents grew up speaking Spanish, but because they had been punished for speaking Spanish in the schoolyard, they decided that their six children would grow up speaking only English. Spanish was the language of secrets for me. And although I understand the language a little bit because of my great aunt Ursinda, my grandmother Margaret, and my great grandmother Cleofas, today, as you know, many Latinx students grow up with English as a first language and may feel like outsiders in both languages. When I went to college, enrolling at the University of Washington, I knew about racial bias because of the Chicano movement and the fight for farm workers' rights. I had heard stories of discrimination from my uncles, but despite the advantage of my parents' expectations that we would go to college and the fact that they made sure I took classes like physics in high school, I didn't know about the imposter syndrome, microaggressions, or gender bias. I didn't have a support group of Latinx students. There was no Office of Diversity. So when a professor of philosophy gave me an F on an essay, but then changed it to an A minus after we talked for an hour, I didn't realize until years later that he probably gave me that F because my essay was handwritten, and even then my handwriting was not great. My name was Via, and I had not been to any of his office hours. I began as a chemistry major, but when my chemistry advisor told me I was having trouble on tests because, quote, women don't belong in chemistry, I didn't question him. I changed my major, initially to history, then eventually to biology, where I was excited by the classes and expected to succeed by most of the professors and TAs. As a sophomore, I also met Tony Komaroff, a medical student who didn't find it at all strange that I wanted to be a scientist. <clears throat> So when he went to NIH after he graduated, I transferred to Goucher College. One of my professors suggested I go to Johns Hopkins, but they weren't accepting women at the time and Goucher was their sister college. I worked there with Dr. Gardner Moment. He always said, cherish your exceptions, an invaluable lesson for a scientist. I got a summer job at NIH with Dr. Loretta Levy who was responsible for getting me into MIT. I had applied to every graduate school in Boston since Tony was going to an internship there from NIH and we were getting married after graduation. When I asked Loretta for references, she asked me, and where is MIT? And I replied, I can't go to MIT, I'm not good at math. She said, you told me you wanted to be a molecular biologist. MIT has the best program in molecular biology in the country and probably in the world. If you're serious about becoming a molecular biologist, you have to at least apply to MIT. Well, it's a good thing I did because it was the only place that accepted me. It taught me that you can't get what you don't ask for. At MIT, 
I studied poliovirus protein synthesis with Harvey Lodish and David Baltimore before he won the Nobel Prize and published five papers. Towards the end of my graduate studies, I presented my thesis work at the FASEV meeting, a joint meeting of several biological societies. There, for the first time, I met other Mexican-American and Native American scientists, and we established SACNAS. The only other woman at that meeting was a member of one of the agencies. SACNAS, now 47 years old, has become the most diverse scientific society dedicated to attracting and encouraging young people from all groups historically underrepresented in science. While I was in graduate school, the advances that made the manipulation of DNA possible were being discovered or invented in labs around the country, including ours. Today, we benefit fit from treatments and medicines made using these advances. It was a wonderful time to be a molecular biologist. After I received my PhD, I worked at Harvard, first in Photoscaphatos lab on the development of the silk moth eggshell, where Argestradiatus was my lab mate. My project depended on connecting moth egg DNA to bacterial DNA to isolate and characterize moth eggshell genes. This kind of work was banned in Cambridge because of concerns that the technology was dangerous. So I joined Tom Maniatis, who had moved to Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories in New York. All of his work depended on the new technology. Nothing worked for a year. This was very bad, since getting a job in the new university and setting up my own lab depended on having publications from my postdoctoral work. Meanwhile, Arge was working with Walla Gilbert, and as I was getting ready to return to Boston, he urged me to join their efforts to make an insulin bacterial DNA recombinant. While I had gotten no publishable results at Cold Spring Harbor, I had become very good at connecting DNA, and I was given a small sample of all the valuable enzymes in the Cold Spring Harbor refrigerator, a priceless treasure. I joined the Gilbert team, and six months later, we not only had made and characterized an insulin bacterial DNA recombinant, that recombinant in bacteria produced insulin. With that paper under my belt, I became an assistant professor at UMass Medical School in Worcester. Tony, meantime, was a faculty member at Harvard Medical School, so we also had a solution to the two-body problem many academic couples face. Eight years later, I received tenure. Despite having made essentially all the mistakes that women and individuals from historically marginalized groups make, I was on too many university committees. I developed and taught more courses than many of my colleagues. I didn't publish enough. In other words, I didn't know that I could say no, and I didn't have the confidence to ask colleagues in my department or elsewhere for advice. Fortunately, I had strong advocates, including Susan Lehman, a formidable endocrinologist on my committee. I'm sure that some of your activities will result in relevant support, not just for students, but for young faculty. After a year of tenure, I accepted a non-tenured position at Harvard Medical School and Children's Hospital. I had a wonderful productive decade there with a talented group of undergraduates, graduate students, postdocs, and collaborators. While I had balanced my research with academic administrative work at Harvard and Children's, I still didn't say often enough no, and after eight years, I began to feel that I needed to change something. Initially, I thought I'd return to the lab full time, but by this time I had learned to ask for advice, and after talking to many wise people, I began to think that perhaps it was time to move to a position where I could use my administrative skills, broad interests, as well as my scientific problem-solving skills. As a direct result of those discussions, I got a call from a headhunter looking to fill a position as Associate VP of Research Administration at Northwestern University in Evanston and Chicago. My first reaction was, why would I want to go to Chicago? I'd only been to O'Hare, by the way. But the headhunter, a woman, replied, look, you don't have to take this job, but if you want a job like it, you have to look at this job. So I went to look, met Bill Kern, the vice president. He was a theoretical chemist. I also met members of the administration and faculty. I took the job and Tony and I commenced a seven year commuter marriage. Bill Kern turned out to be as spectacular a mentor in the administrative arena as David, Harvey and Wally were in the research arena. Two years after I became associate VPR, I was appointed vice president for research after a national search. I loved that job. 
It was a position where my broad interest became a strength. It taught me to appreciate the work of colleagues in all areas of scholarship, the humanities, the social sciences, as well as the natural sciences and engineering. And I had the privilege of working with a team led by President Henry Beenan to increase the standing of Northwestern. President Beenan was a spectacular fundraiser. So I had the resources to make strategic investments in the faculty and students. Don Jacobs, the Dean Emeritus of the Business School and his successor, Deepak Jain, invited me to attend the one month 24 seven advanced executive program called an MBA in a box. That course prepared me for future opportunities. After seven years, it was time to end commuting and return to Boston. I had tried to recruit the superstar Susan Linquist to Northwestern, but she ended up recruiting me to the Whitehead Institute where she had become the first woman director. During my time at the Whitehead, I joined my first corporate board and a year later became chair of that board, a story for another time. Susan decided to return to the bench full-time after three years and I moved to the corporate world, joining a company that had been started by Wally Gilbert's son, John. It's an illustration of a, the power of networking and staying in touch. After six months, John and I switched roles. I became CEO and he became chief technical officer. After a year, John decided to continue as a serial entrepreneur and went on to found, found other companies. And I had to find funding for Sidenome, another story for another time but you can see how valuable that Kellogg Business School experience was. In 2014, after nine years and three logos, I left management at Sidenome. After a year, I was tired of introducing myself as a former, former faculty, former VP, former CEO. And so I established a one person company to be an umbrella for my activities. Now I serve on committees and boards and give talks like this one at different institutions. At this point, I am primarily focused on issues that account for the slow change in the representation of us, people like us, in colleges, universities, and companies, despite the rapidly changing demographics of the country and the statement by most places that they really would like to have more diversity and that it is important, especially in STEM. So my role is to introduce faculty and administrators and company management who may or may not know, who may not know or appreciate the social sciences to the biological basis of decision-making and how that can result in decisions that perpetuate the lack of diversity despite their desire to increase representation. This slide summarizes that presentation. I want to thank you for this opportunity to provide this address, and I hope we can visit in person sometime. Congratulations again, as you celebrate the accomplishments that reflect your commitment to diversity and equity. Thank you so much, Lydia, for your words of inspiration. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Chad Hamill, the Vice President of Native American Initiatives. Ah, yes, halt, Petsia. Good day, everyone. I'm going to offer a song, but before I do, I wanted to honor those that are receiving the Diversity Award. I want to thank you for your dedication and your commitment to creating a more diverse NAU, but also contributing to an environment that's more inclusive, compassionate, and socially just. The song I'm going to offer is a coyote song, and it centers on a coyote story about the formation of the Columbia River what we call Inquinequa. Columbia River and its tributaries um, have been vital and very important to First Peoples in the interior Northwest, um, all the way out to uh, the coast. And this river has been in a state of perpetual movement for many thousands of years. And I see that as a, an apt metaphor for the work that we're doing here at NAU to open the door for students from underserved communities and create an environment um, that is open to all. So if you listen carefully, um, this song begins with a representation of the first drops of water that eventually became 
is great in Quinequa. For the presentation of the awards by NAU's Diversity and Equity Commissions. We are pleased to announce the recipients for this year's Leadership Award for the Commission on Disability Access and Design, or CDAD. CDAD is a diversity commission, one of the five diversity commissions at NAU focused on disability rights and disability advocacy at NAU. The commission's mission is to create an inclusive and welcoming environment through the removal of physical and attitudinal barriers with universal design and universal design for learning. I'm Chris Lanterman, one of the co-chairs for the CDAD, and I'm gonna turn it over now to my co-chair, Dorian Pollack. Hi, I'm Dorian Pollack, and I'm very happy to present this first award to Selena Neville. She is a four year graduate from our university, and she has worked tirelessly throughout her four years to learn about her major field in construction management, and more than that, participate in providing access through the internships and externships that she has completed with McCarthy Construction. She also works at NAPDA, our public transportation system here in Flagstaff to allow all students with disabilities to ride free on our public buses. The second award I would like to present is for Morgan Mason. 
Morgan has worked for NAU for nine years. She began in 2011 as a student worker, then a student team lead, then she became a full-time employee. Morgan organizes, trains student workers, and coordinates services to provide access of instructional materials, documents, and videos to all faculty, staff, and students. She is the program management manager for the Usable Materials Center. And without her, we would not at all have the capacity for accessibility that we have now. Thank you, Morgan. Hi, everyone. This is Morgan Mason. And I just wanted to say thank you so much for honoring me this year at the Diversity and Equity Awards. I'm so appreciative to even be recognized, and I'm very proud to work for Disability Resources and be a part of our team and staff. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. Go Jacks. Um, I would like to present our last two recipients for this year's CDAB Leadership Award. The first is Judy Mayner. Judy is our Assistant Director of Shuttle Services here at NAU. Judy is a longtime member of CDAD, and she has worked tirelessly to create a shuttle system that is accessible and usable for all members of the university community. One of the major impacts that she has had on our shuttle system is the installation of uh, notifications for stops along the routes. This notification system allows folks to know where they're getting off, despite whether they're able to see out the shuttle windows or whether they are able to um, see where the shuttle has been, um, has, has parked. Judy has worked through every semester um, on the CDAD participating in our accessibility scavenger hunt which is an event that we hold uh, each year, twice each year, to uh, explore the university community for the ways in which it uh, enables or constrains equitable participation within the physical environment. And exploring uh, the ways in which the university has applied the principles of universal design already. And our final recipient is Sean Thomas. Sean Thomas uh, is a lecturer or was a lecturer in our Department of Teaching and Learning up until this past spring. She left Flagstaff and went to work as a principal in uh, California. She has also uh, worked diligently over many years now to promote universal design and Universal Design for Learning uh, within our College of Education. Um, Sean Thomas and several of her colleagues worked over this course of this past academic year with the Flagstaff Arts and Leadership Academy to promote curriculum that includes both Universal Design for Learning and culturally responsive teaching practices. Sean has been an advocate and a promoter of um, inclusive practices over her many years here at NAU. And with that, we conclude our acknowledgement and recognition of our recipients for this year. Congratulations to each and all of you. And we look forward to seeing you all again at some time on our campus. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Just like a vital organ within the human body, the Commission on Ethnic Diversity is a necessary valve within the heart of Northern Arizona University. Like the human heart, valves keep blood moving in the right direction. The Commission's purpose is to be one of the forces in which justice righteousness and compassion for all people flow throughout the NAU community in a positive and productive direction, 
especially those of diverse backgrounds. Without the valve, without CED, injustice could threaten the vitality of the healthy heart. I believe in Northern Arizona University. I believe that we all have a role in sustaining the true heart of a lumberjack. My name is Denise Trimble Smith, and I am the chair of the Commission on Ethnic Diversity. CED is very proud to congratulate our awardees for our Diversity Awards 2020. Our organizational award goes to Soul Sugar. Our faculty award goes to Diane Squire. I want to thank my colleague and co-instructor Sharon Doctor from Indigenous Student Success. Without Sharon, this course would not have been as impactful and personally enriching for both the students and myself. I'm grateful to have had the opportunity to teach this course and for our students to take their learning about Indigenous student success into their offices. By doing so, we can ensure that we continue to expand the equitable and just life possibilities that Indigenous students have at NAU. I also continue to stand and act in solidarity with Indigenous, Black, and other marginalized communities against systemic oppression. As always, we must continue to demand Native justice now and be clear that Black Lives Matter. And our second faculty award goes to Nancy Baron. Thank you for honoring me with the Diversity and Equity Award 2020. I am Nancy Guerra Barron, y este año marca el 19 con NAU. Disfruto enseñar conceptos diversos. My family tiene una extensa historia en Arizona y México, y como somos mestizos Jackie, I included los benaditos. Choco the Wonder Pup often accompanies me while I teach. Mil gracias de nuestra familia. Our staff award goes to Sharon Doctor. Hi, this is Sharon Doctor with the Office of Indigenous Student Success. We are a student affairs department located in the Native American Cultural Center. I would like to thank the Commission on Ethnic Diversity and the Office of the President for being selected as a recipient this year. I also would like to congratulate my co-recipient, Dr. Dean Squire with the College of Education, and most of all, Thank you to Holly Wheeler for submitting this nomination. Hi, I'm Chelsea Green. I'm speaking today as a co-chair of the LGBTQIA Commission as one of the five diversity commissions on campus. Our mission is the acceptance and support of folks in the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, two-spirit, queer, intersex, asexual, pansexual, polyamorous, demisexual, and many other communities that represent the diversity of human orientation and identity. Folks in these communities face judgment and shame in heteronormative societies. We strive to support those whose expressions of themselves draw ire with respect and celebration. Because survival is a miracle for any generation, but even more so, it seems lately, and thriving is a celebration of that miracle, we are grateful to be a part of this community's celebration here today. The LGBTQIA Commission has contributed to and continues to support the president's recently adopted diversity strategic plan. And we have enjoyed the support of the president's office as well. Through their contributions, we have been able to provide programming and development opportunities that support our students and community. We are grateful to have the opportunity to thank those in our community who have risen above in the last year. Thanks, Chelsea. Hi, I'm Ari Burford. As co-chair of the LGBTQIA Commission, I'm honored to work with such amazing faculty, staff, students at NAU, as well as uh, individuals from the community outside of NAU, who all do so much work, uh, intellectual and emotional labor to bring awareness, educate, and create change. Such struggles for change and liberation from intersecting oppressions that our community faces require collective efforts. The individuals we recognize tonight 
are a vital part of that collective work that is so necessary. We thank you, we honor you, all that you do, all that you have done, and all that you keep doing. Staff, Carl Dindo. Ally member, Shelby Reed. Hi, I'm Shelby Reed, physical therapist at Campus Health Services, she, her, hers, ally in training. Special thanks to my daughter, Lyndon, and her wife, Diana, who bring me joy and perspectives from queer students. They urge me to speak to you on behalf of students who need university housing that is non-binary, easy to opt into, and without undue disclosure, especially during the pandemic and changing university schedules, housing that is stable. As they would say, it's a matter of safety. Thank you. Faculty, Dr. Jesse Kisar. Hi. Um, I just wanted to thank the LGBTQIA Commission for this award. Um, I am always so inspired and excited by, and sometimes kind of floored by the commitment and um, intelligent questioning and bravery and struggle that the uh, queer community at NAU is really engaging in. Um, so thank you for that. And thank you for inspiring me. Um, Stay strong and powerful and take care of each other. Um, mwah. Bye. Student Deborah Corey. Thank you. I would first like to thank the LGBTQIA Diversity Commission for honoring me with this award. I would like to thank my advisors, Dr. Joe Wegwert and Dean Ramona Malott. And most of all, I would like to thank the advocates of the trans community for participating with me in this research. Hello, I'm uh, Dr. Sanja Maluwalia, and I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Dr. Francis Rima. We both serve as the co-chairs of the Commission on Status of Women at NAU. Uh, at NAU, the Commission's uh, work towards promoting the new diversity strategic plan to achieve, true to achieve a true diversity university. Um, I just want to take a minute to introduce the Commission on Status of Women and to give you a little more information on what we do. Uh, NAU's undergraduate student population is 61% female identified and participation of the Commission on the Status of Women is essential to NAU's diversity plans and initiatives. Uh, the Commission on the Status of Women makes recommendations to the president and the leadership about women's issues and gender issues, and they address concerns in university policies, practices, and programs to enact constructive change. Uh, the Commission then promotes and advocates, uh, as I said, for gender equity, parity, and inclusivity. It seeks to foster a diverse, safe, and welcoming campus environment and helps to create a family-friendly community. Uh, I will now turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Francis Rima, to announce the awardees for the CSW Award for 2019-2020. Please take it away, Dr. Francis. Thank you, Sanjam. Uh, so we have, we, we have four members of our NAU community uh, that were uh, awarding this year. First, we have the 2019-2020 CSW Project Award, uh, Molly Bechtel and Dr. Adana Romero for their development and facilitation of the graduate student seminar, Gender Bias in STEM, and their work revealing biases in the laboratory, the academy, and the disciplines around gender. So thank you both for that important work. 
I'm Molly Bechtel, and it's an honor to be recognized for my work fighting to end ignorance and biases towards people of differing genders in STEM fields, especially now as we find ourselves in a pivotal point in history in which people of all differing identities that have been traditionally marginalized are now taking hold of past conventions that not only disregard them as whole people, but also as scientists, and they're making their voices heard. I'm privileged to be doing this work at NAU, and I'm proud to be a part of this renewal of equality in STEM, and I accept this diversity award for my seminar our gender bias and STEM fields. I'm thankful for this honor and even more. I'm grateful for the collective work we are all doing to create a world in which the great diversity of each individual's unique characteristics yeah, are wildly valued, respected, and seen as gifts. Thank you. Uh, secondly, we have the 2019-2020 CSW Staff Award uh, to Melissa Griffin for the direction of health promotion with campus health, campus health services and leadership on sexual assault and relationship to violence task force and on student training and programs focusing on women's health. Thank you so much, Melissa, for that essential campus work. And Lastly, we have the 2019-2020 CSW Faculty Award for Leadership, which is going to Dr. Karen Renner. Dr. Renner, Renner was indefatigable in moving the CSW Wage Equity Project to fruition and to furthering essential conversations on campus about gender equity, parity, and inclusivity. We congratulate all four of our awardees and are very pleased and uh, appreciative of all of your work. Great, congratulations everyone. And thank you for joining us um, in recognizing and celebrating our awardees for the Commission on Status of Women. Thank you. Thank you. Hello friends and relatives, Yati, Iglanita. My name is Shirley Conrad. I am from the Yellowknives Dene First Nations in Northern Canada. I am the Administrative Associate here at the Office of Native American Initiatives. The Commission for Native Americans comprised of Native American staff, faculty and allies throughout the NAU campus plays a critical role in ensuring that NAU lives up to the strategic commitment to Native Americans while assisting NAU in becoming a true diversity university. All those being honored this evening have made invaluable contributions to these efforts. The following awards bear the name of an extraordinary individual, Cal Sasawa. Mr. Sasawa was raised in the Zuni area and spent much of his youth involved in his family's farming, ranching, and sheep herding activities. He was a member of Zuni's Badger Clan, born for the Eagle Clan, and maintained close ties with his Zuni cultural and spiritual heritage. In 2006, he and his family sponsored a Shalako home, contributing to the tribe's most important religious ceremony. Cal came to the Institute of Tribal Environmental Professionals at Northern Arizona University after more than 15 years at Arizona State University, where he served as director of the American Indian Institute, an organization whose mission was to recruit and retain Native American students at ASU. As ITEP's director, he helped to forge new programs to provide direct assistance and services to tribes across the country to address environmental protection and management issues. Before his career with ASU and NAU, Cal served in various settings as a teacher and school administrator, tribal administrator and coordinator of intertribal efforts on issues such as cultural preservation, Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, the Indian Economic Enterprise Programs and Infrastructure Development. Please join me in congratulating the following, who are the recipients for the Cal Sasawa Awards. They are Simeona Beasley,
Calvina Baylin. Dr. Priscilla Sanderson, and, and Dr. Tommy Lewis. All of them have contributed to making NAU a more welcoming and supportive institution for our Indigenous communities. Thank you very much to all of you. Congratulations. Congratulations to all our award winners, and thank you all for joining us tonight. Continue to be safe and healthy, and remember, our fight is a righteous fight, and we are on the right side of history. <laughs>